Hello, it's Steve White, Trickboy89 for Steve Arts 89 Star Trek's Gatekeeper. Um, I recently did a video about the Borg Queen and I was doing a comparison of the new Borg Queen from Picard and the original Borg Queen from First Contact and Voyager. And um, during that, I was I did a bit of research and I wanted to talk about the design and I mentioned it, but I kind of got distracted and never got back to it. And what I said was the original Borg Queen concept was originally designed by H.R. Geiger, originally, then they did a whole bunch of variations and designs, and I never really got back to it. Now, this upset one of the um, makeup artists who worked on First Contact, Scott Wheeler, um, and he put up on his Facebook page and I uh, got comments from him and comments from some of his fans and some insults and stuff. And um, basically, I, I didn't mean to say that, because um, I know better. I know that um, H.R. Geiger was consulted to design the Borg Queen. Uh, they spoke to him, he had some concepts, they didn't like them, and they parted ways, and he never actually worked on the film. And I, I know that, but um, I just misspoke. What I meant to say was he was the first person brought on um, to design for the film, and then I was kind of planning to talk about the rest of it. But there was a little bit more to it, because... Um, he has been sort of traced to the design of the Borg itself, um, and I was sort of thinking of that, um, and I just misspoke. But um, originally, Morris Hurley created the Borg, and they were originally insectoids, insectoids. Uh, then they were made into cyborgs because of, you know, budget. Um, they were an autonomous collective, and the uh, costume designer, Jorinda Ricewood, um, actually made the Borg design, the costumes, and um, Michael Westmore did the faces, but she did the, uh, the whole costume. And she was said to have been inspired by H.R. Geiger's work and a particular picture that she'd seen of H.R. Geiger's work, of his biomechanical um, beings and that. So, um, and other people were saying it was also similar to Lord of the Dead, a character from a show called Captain Power, which apparently she worked for the same company that um, produced that show, is what I'm hearing, but these are all just things I've read on the internet, I'm not exactly sure. There was a quote that was attributed to her um, saying that she was inspired by H.R. Geiger's work, but that was actually someone quoting someone saying, when I went and looked at it, um, tried to find the source of it, um, that was someone quoting someone saying that she was inspired by He's got work. I wasn't actually able to find the original quote. Now, considering that was in 1987, 88, and it was probably published, and someone was just repeating that because they read it somewhere, it's kind of hard to trace stuff that was sort of before the internet. So, um, but yeah, so Geiger, I mean, when you look at his work and you look at the Borg, you can see, you know, in my opinion, um, a clear connection, and you can see that there was inspiration there. Um, and it has been stated, but I can't directly, you know, get a quote from um, Dorina Ricewood. Now, her idea was that they were a race that used replacement parts. So they would surgically remove body parts and put in um, implants, and that's how they survived and continued there. And they all had individual combinations of these parts and that. And she designed a suit made out of popcorn spandex um, and Velcro parts and then pipes and things and they were very individual, and it was an original look, and it was very scary, and the Borg was an amazing concept at the time. Um, now, when they went into first contact, um, the, uh, uh, who was it? Rick Berman was the producer, of course, and he was talking to Jonathan Frakes. He showed him a draft that was done by um, Brandon Bragger, and... Um, I've forgotten the names of the writers. I didn't write them down, but you all know who wrote First Contact, you know. Um, and Jonathan saw a draft and he said, there, there needs to be a villain, a person, that the audience needs a villain to centre on. So they sat down, Rick sat down with the writers, and um, they sort of looked at the sort of hive idea and they said, well, we need a queen. So that was how, apparently, is how the Borg Queen was created. And that was from a quote from Rick Berman in one of the books that I read. Um, I've looked through several books today. I spent about 10 hours um, researching to try and get the path of the Borg Queen and her design. Um, I mean, I looked at Star Trek magazine with articles and interviews by Ian Spelling from 2006, um, Star Trek costumes, the book by Paul M. Block and Jerry um, Terry J. Enderman um, from Titan Books from 2015, the continuing miss mission um, by Judith and Garfield Reeves Stevens from Pocket Books in 1997. Uh, Star Trek Next Generation, Generations and First Contact Sketchbook by John Eves and J.M. Dillard from Pocket Books in 1998. Uh, First Contact, official movie souvenir magazine with um, interviews by Larry Nemechek um, from Titan in 1996. 
And the Star Trek Collector's Edition um, from G.E. Fabry uh, with writers Chris Dowles, Peter Griffin, Griffiths, and um, Jim Swallow from 2004. So those are the most useful sources. I looked at a lot of other things, but those were the things I actually sort of am sort of quoting um, in my notes that I've got here. Um, so yeah, so the early script had the Borg Queen hover on cables above Picard and Data, and she was just a torso. She had no legs. Um, now Herman Zimmerman's art department had uh, the illustrator Ricardo Delgado working on it. Now um, he had the idea that her legs would be waiting for her, that they would be combined, and he was also inspired by uh, the Egyptian ruler Nefertiti and the Bride of Frankenstein and the Black Widow Spider, and he tried to combine these along with some other insectoid elements from grasshoppers and things, and he came up with some very interesting ideas, because he was an illustrator, um, they basically look at the script and they try to visualise what the, um, the writers have written, and it's part of the process of developing the film, basically, in the production. Um, I wasn't really clear on what um, illustrators did versus what designers did and stuff like that, because I've learned all this stuff a long time ago and forgotten it. Um, but um, Delgado left, and John Eves took over as illustrator, and he designed a heavy rig with cables that would connect the Queen because um, they sort of had the idea of, you know, the queen being two parts and being joined. And um, the producers, um, they weren't really happy with that. They thought it was too heavy. Um, but they did change the idea to um, her just being a head and shoulders that was put into a um, body, a mechanical body that was separate. And they hired Alex J. Jager, um, Alex Jager, um, to design the head and shoulders. Um, and Deborah Everton to design the bodies via the costumes because she was a costume designer. And um, often these productions have teams that work together and combine, like, you know, the Borg is both makeup and costume, and the costume designer would do the regular costumes as well as the alien costumes, and some of those would actually go into the makeup department, literally because they're makeups as well as costumes. So it all intermingles quite a bit. Um, now, um, <laughs> Jager had um, a design with spikes and a spine that he sort of did with Photoshop that he'd used a photo of um, one of the ILM staff, because he was from ILM, um, and the staff member was, name was Marianne Heath. Um, and they were um, added to Everton's Ball Queen design because she had finished the Ball Queen design, the costume, and uh, she had the Ball Queen's physical uh, body, head and shoulders, um, skin part, basically just being a regular human head and shoulders which was um, bald and just had a couple of little lines on it and that's it. There was really no design to that. So um, Jager had a design with spikes and a spine and that was added to the, the head and shoulders part and um, that was kind of the, um, the look. They sort of had the look then apparently and Alex did some storyboards having uh, multiple cables lowering her down and they reduced it to three to save money. And uh, at, that, at some point um, Todd Masters was made the Borg design supervisor and he was chosen to make the costumes and basically take them from design to real as opposed to, I guess, the costume designer um, making it themselves because um, she was working with an illustrator as well, I forgot to mention. Um, her name was Gina Flanagan. And um, so they worked on the, 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 the look and the design, and then they passed it over to um, Todd's team to actually make it. Um, so he was chosen to make the costumes, and he also had to stage the combining sequence, which was a huge ordeal trying to do that, because originally Eileen wanted to do it as CGI and um, film the elements separately and at different times and not on the stage. And he said, we really need to make this real. And they found a way to put um, Alice Krieg on, um, like a rig and just lower her down wrapped in blue screen with um, the Borg head and shoulders prosthetic and then they filmed her in the, the bodysuit and doing both halves of the scene and then they just combined them and morphed the two together. I originally thought they lowered her makeup down into um, a, a dummy body and literally did it that way I did, and I thought they just tweaked it a bit. I didn't realise they'd actually combined two separate um, video, you know, um, filmed parts of her and then morphed the two together in like in between the words basically. Um, okay, so <laughs> where am I? Okay, um, yeah, because he, he argued to do that um, practical. Um, um, 
over like, you know, um, green screen rather than doing green screen and everything like that. Now, at some point, um, Jeremy a um, Aiello, um, he was also part of Todd's team and he, because I've sort of got some conflicting um, things, but like I said, there's a huge team of people working together and I'd heard that Jeremy Aiello, Aiello actually designed um, the, 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 look, the look of the Boar Queen along with um, Todd. But I'm also hearing that they just, they didn't design the look, they just actually made them. And that may have involved some refining and additional design work, but um, the whole difference between who did the concept, who did the design, who actually made the practical, um, the actual thing, it's, it's kind of hard to work out exactly who did who, especially when this is, this is coming from interviews from decades ago. Um, now, Deborah suggested hooks to secure the Queen's flesh. ILM designed them. Um, now, at that point, Scott Wheeler um, was brought in and given the task of, and this is in um, Michael Westmore's words, to find the finishing details of the Queen. Uh, Michael Westmore thought to extend her head um, for more brain capacity, and Wheeler sculpted the extended um, piece, headpiece, and the implants and everything. Um, and Westmore said he did a wonderful job um, and basically the look that he got from it. And um, he was very happy with it, it got approved. And it's the final piece that was sculpted and made into makeup and you know actually put onto um, Alice Krieg. Although they did remove the eyebrows apparently because she didn't like the, eye the, the eyebrows and they did a piece with it and without it, they put the one without it on. They were ha all happy with it and they went with that. Now, um, um, Deborah had said that um, she collaborated with Michael, um, so with the help of her um, illustrator Gina Flanagan and um, working with Michael, they came up with the overall look um, of the Ball Queen. And then it appears the Alex Jager designs, those elements were added, and then Michael extended the head, um, and all those, you got, see all those three elements together. Now, what um, Scott Wheeler did, I'm not sure because I haven't seen a final design of any of those elements. I've seen the the design of um, of um, Jager's spiked Borg Queen. I've seen the design of the Borg costume with just a regular human head, and um, I've seen the final product with the extended head and all the details and all the um, um, wires and cables and the lights and everything, the lights under the skin, all that stuff. Um, and apparently it's a collaborative effort, and like um, Scott mentioned, you know, a lot of people worked on this, and other people worked on it, and um, it's all, all the team effort, it's not just one person, but there are specific things that are defined as designed by or attributed to, so it's very difficult to work all that out. Um, now, back to Deborah's costume, when she was doing the look, she wanted a similar look um, to the original Borg design, but just more elaborate. Um, she wanted it to look like they were borgified from the inside out, not from the outside in, not that things were stuck to them, um, not implants put in um, and parts removed, but they were, because now they were being done by um, nanobots and that, um, inside, they were injected inside and they changed the people from, you know, humans to org from the inside out. So that was a different approach to the costume she gave. She wanted to give it added depth and layers because of the way they're actually changed. Um, so that was something that she was sort of talking about. Um, now, Michael Westmore also added that, um, of course, um, Scott actually made her up as well and that she didn't complain about anything. But um, they did apparently, originally the costume was made out of heavy rubber and then at some point, even though she wasn't complaining about it, they changed it into soft foam rubber for her, which made it a lot more comfortable. Um, now, I was looking at interviews and stuff as well and in the Star Trek special, First Contact Special Features, there is a video where um, Jonathan Frakes, it's called the Borg Collective Design Matrix, and he says that um, the look was brilliant and he credited it to um, Michael Westmore and um, Deborah um, Wheeler. So, and, and I've seen pictures of the designs that she did and they're printed in books and that, so she did work on the design. Um, that's really not, I don't think, in question. Um, and I'm just looking at research and looking at books. I'm not the one actually, you know, um, I wasn't there. Um, I'm just, you know, talking about what I've researched and what I've seen. And this all works together. If you look at it, it all gels, all the things all seem to work in sequence and work together and it all makes sense. And the journey is kind of clear how she went. Um, the only really issue 
that I can't work out is um, exactly what designs were, uh, what the finished designs looked like and what was given to um, Scott um, when he was given the task of finalising the design, um, which is what Westmore referred to it as, and um, actually sculpting the, um, the, the, the head and shoulders and um, what he added and brought to that. Um, because that's considered the final design that he did and that is credited to him and he was the one who, when they got the Oscar nomination, he was one of the three names um, that was nominated. It was Michael Westmore, him and somebody else. Um, so I'm not trying to say he didn't do the final design. I'm not trying to say that H.R. Geiger did the design and he didn't. By original design, what I meant was he was the first person brought in who was originally consulted to design it and then that didn't happen. I didn't go into all that detail. And I'm not saying that this guy, because I didn't know who he was. I had no idea who he was. I never heard his name. I didn't recognize it. And when he came on and started commenting, I honestly thought he was a troll. And when I looked at his YouTube, um, there was no content. And I thought, yeah, someone's just made this profile up just so they can message me and troll me, because that's happened to me a bunch of times. And then when I asked him about um, um, John Eaves, he didn't know who he was. He didn't recognize the name. And I said, yeah, you're definitely not the real person. You cannot have worked on First Contact and not known who John Eaves was. He designed the Enterprise E. He did a lot of work on that. Um, so... Um, and he just forgot the guy's name, and he felt really embarrassed afterwards, and he, and he said publicly that, yes, I worked with him, I know him, I just didn't connect the name. But um, because he did that, I honestly didn't think he was the real deal. I thought he was a fake who was just trying to um, troll me, basically. So I didn't mean any disrespect, I didn't mean to say um, anything against the design or anything. And like I said, I don't know what final design he was given, and how much he added to it, whether they just gave him the script and said, um, described what the other designers had the point they'd gotten to, but I can't really imagine they would have paid all that money for all those designs um, from um, Deborah and, um, um, I'm forgetting all the names now, um, Alex and everyone, and not have given him something to work with. And he may have redesigned that and done his own design, which was considered the original design that was what he sculpted and what was actually put onto Alice Craig and appears in the final film. But um, I just, I just, I just feel that all the elements, all the things that went into this design are all valid and I, I know that there's different journeys and um, people work on the film for a part and then they hand it over to someone else and you don't necessarily know who's done what and what you've been given and who that comes from and so forth. So I get that it's a collaborative process, it's a village and sometimes you're not aware of what other people have done and sometimes people talk about their part and someone else talks about their part and it sounds like people are taking credit for different things and it's a bit confusing. But um, I didn't mean any harm, and I was really rude to him in the messages because I honestly thought he was a troll, and I was just being as bitchy as I could because I was just annoyed by this person coming on telling me um, that he worked on the production and I didn't know what I was talking about, and um, he didn't know who John Eaves was, and I'm like, who is this person? I practically told him to F off. Um, and then I realised, oh, that's the real makeup artist. Oh, he knows Michael Westmore and um, John Eaves, who is now on his Facebook, and they're both trashing me, um, which is really painful because I love those designers, I love Star Trek, I love the production of it. I wanted to work on Star Trek when I was younger, I thought one day I'd be working in Hollywood and I'd be working on films and I'd get to work on a Star Trek production. So to have the actual people who worked on the production think I'm um, some YouTube um, toxic fan and um, it's, 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 it's not fun. So I'm doing this video to make that right. Um, basically, because I did message him, um, uh, private message him and that, and we talked a little bit, he wanted me to um, correct the mistakes and set things right, um, but um, I was asking him questions, and unfortunately he's working on a production now and he couldn't get back to me before I did this video, so I don't have some of the answers. Um, I thought he was working on Boba Fett, but that's finished, so I don't know where I got that from. I think it's because he was actually working on Obi-Wan, um, and now he's working on, I think, a film, but um, I got confused. I said earlier in our video he was working on Boba Fett, but Boba Fett is finished, so I just got confused there. Um, it's easy to do when you're doing videos and you don't script things, you just talk, and um, then um, whatever comes out, comes out. <laughs> but um, this is a very long video, but I managed, I'm glad I covered everything, I got through everything, I didn't screw up, because sometimes you make them, and this happened with the Borkwin video, the other one, um, you start talking, you mess up, you have to do the video a few times, sometimes, because sometimes it's just quicker to start from scratch and do a 10 minute video again than it is to re-record a section and edit a video you've already recorded, but then you have to remember everything you said, 
and sometimes you'll be talking and you feel like yes I covered that but you actually said that in the video before and then you forget something like I was planning to talk about the ball queen design in the first video and I totally forgot about it I got distracted and um, I just made the reference to H.R. Geiger which was incorrect um, because what I meant to say was that he was the original inspiration for the Borg design and that he was the first person brought on to work on First Contact but then it didn't work out and then they went on with other designs. That's what I meant to talk about but it just ended up being um, a, a, a little comment um, that wasn't correct. So I just wanted to sort all that out and do another video and um, apologise for being rude to, um, to Scott um, Wheeler and anyone else because I, I just honestly didn't realise that I was talking to the real people. I didn't think they'd pay any attention to my video. So I just thought of someone trolling me. And um, yeah, I get a lot of that. And you kind of get defensive when you go into your comment section sometimes. But I'm going to go. Feel free to share, like, comment, subscribe. Let me know what you think of the design and the video and everything. I'm going to go.